So what are we conjuring up this time? This is the Flying Bear Shine. It's the Flying Bear Ghost, you How many ghost how many ghost puns are we gonna make during this thing? At least five or six more. Just roll the intro. So this printer was sent to me directly from Flying Bear for review. And when I started reading up on the specifications, I got pretty excited because I liked what I saw. It has a solid metal construction with acrylic paneling applied to most of the outside, which means that it should hold a tee pretty well, and it's also not going to be much of a struggle to get it fully enclosed to print more temperature sensitive materials like ABS and the, and the like. In terms of build size, it can handle 230 on the X by 230 on the Y by 210 on the Z. It uses an HBOT configuration, so called because the smooth rods on the top, which are responsible for moving the hot end, are arranged to look like a letter H. The system runs on 24 volts, which means that it should heat pretty quickly, and the entire system is controlled by a resistive touchscreen on the front. From that touchscreen, you can do things such as homing, preheating, and printing, and you can also set up the printer to act as a Wi-Fi hotspot. So it showed up and I was ready to build it, and one of the things that was the most exciting to me is how safe this printer should be out of the box. Now, one of the smart things they've done is that the bottom base is responsible for all the electronics, and you get it pre-wired. So that means all you have to do is stick a power cord in the back. There's no messing with mains wires. There's no trying to wire up the hot end or any of that stuff yourself. It's ready to go out of the box. Everything else is handled by clipping connectors together. So I did the build on a live stream and the instructions were okay. They walk you through everything step by step. The videos are played in real time. So you just sort of follow along with what you see. The only real complication I ran into is that there's an anti-backlash nut for the Z-axis and in the instruction video it showed it installed one way but Chris from Practical Printing pointed out that the pictures of this printer had it installed a different way. When I looked at the pictures that made more sense and that's the way we went. So I really want to thank Chris for uh, helping out there. He came through in a bind. So with the printer built it was time to turn it on and unfortunately this is when the ghost lived up to its name. It was dead on arrival. But I wasn't ready to give up the ghost yet, so I contacted Flying Bear and let them know that it wasn't working, and it only took me a couple of minutes of digging into the box underneath to find out that the power supply had basically fried itself. So I showed them the evidence, and they arranged for a new power supply to get sent out to me, and I got it and installed it, and we should have been off to the races. But unfortunately, more problems struck. But in the spirit of doing a full review, I contacted them again and let them know. You see, what had happened when the power supply had died is that it had also taken the main board and the hot end with it. Well, it wasn't too big of a deal for the hot end because they actually provide two. The hot end sort of a combination between what the CR10 uses and a V6 clone type situation. Uh, it looks like a V6 clone on the outside, but the way it's designed, the actual PTFE tube that you put into it goes all the way down to the nozzle, much like what the CR10 does. So I got a new board, I flashed it with their firmware, and we were finally up and running. So with the printer finally moving under its own power, it was time to get to leveling the bed. Leveling the bed is done as you would expect on most printers by tightening thumb screws on each corner. Adjusting the screw for the Z limit switch, however, is a complete pain. You have to reach underneath the bed into the back, and you can see that it comes up sort of in through here. And uh, it was really hard to get your hand torqued in around there. There's gotta be an easier way to do it. Um, I mean, I guess it comes down to something you only do once in a blue moon, but it's still very inconvenient. They advertise that this printer is capable of hitting speeds up to 150 millimeters a second. However, I wouldn't really advise going much past 120 millimeters a second. Beyond that, you're definitely going to have some quality loss. And if you're just printing something rough without a lot of details, 150 millimeters a second is probably a possibility, but keep that in mind. Loading filament into this printer is a bit of a pain. As with most filament loads, you're going to want to cut the filament at an angle, and then you'll slide it through the filament out detection sensor. But the problem here is that the filament out detection sensor and the actual input for the extruder seem to want them cut at opposite angles. So what I ended up doing a lot of the time was feeding it through the sensor, then recutting it on the other side, and then pushing it through the extruder. 
Internally, the filament runout detection sensor is actually just a mechanical end stop switch, and uh, this actually causes some weird issues. Number one, the filament can bind up a bit on it, and uh, it's because there's nothing really for it to slide smoothly against. The other issue I kept running into is that with certain slightly thinner filaments, when it retracted, it would actually push the lever back and cause the filament runout detection to trigger, even though the filament hadn't actually run out. This is something that could be cured pretty simply by redesigning it ever so slightly and using uh, a mechanical switch that has a roller on the end rather than sliding it along metal. The recover from power loss and recover from filament runout detection work just as you would expect. It starts off the print again right where it left off and uh, there was, as with most of these solutions, a little bit of an inconsistency left. You know, a little bit of a half of a layer line type thing missing where it restarted the print. But having a little imperfection that you have to sand or fill away is a lot better than losing a long print. This printer uses something that's akin to like the Ultra Base, where it's a glass surface with a texture applied to the top of it. And ABS loved it in my tests. This brute stuck no problem to it whatsoever, and it printed darn near perfect, other than the fact that there was a little bit of layer separation on it, which is definitely going to be cured by finishing the enclosure around the printer so that it holds in the heat. PLA, on the other hand, was a bit of a different beast. It didn't really want to stick all that well until I hit it with just a little bit of hairspray to give it a little bit of coercion. I found that hitting it with hairspray every couple of prints meant that the PLA print would stick no problem, and uh, this phaser here is actually a perfect example of that. It was printed with these two surfaces, there's a split down the middle, flat on the bed, and I didn't have to sand them at all to get them to marry up just perfect. No warping whatsoever, and uh, it's going to be just a little bit of sanding around the edges to make it disappear completely. The quality of the prints coming off this printer have been quite good so far. There's only been a little bit of hairline string that'll be probably cured by tuning the profile, and it's the kind of stuff that just a quick pass over with a heat gun will actually take care of. So as I continue printing my test prints from this bag to this Country 3D Protonome to this Benchy with stand and phaser, I started noting, noticing some weird inconsistencies in the performance of the printer. The bed would start pausing as it was moving up and moving down. It would pause for a couple of seconds and start moving again. The kind of thing you see when a motor is not getting enough power. So I was about to dig into it when I heard sparks coming from underneath it. So I turned the printer off quickly and I took a look underneath and found that the stepper motor driver for the Z-axis had actually burned itself out. So it was at this point that I decided that this is where I had to cut off the review. I think what happened is when the power supply died, it took a lot of the electronic components with it or at least weakened them. You can see that in the slowly degrading performance of the stepper motor for the Z-axis and then the final burnout on it. So unfortunately I can't speak for the reliability on this printer. I think the design is well done. It moves quickly and efficiently. There's no real torsion that you can apply to the actual frame of it to get it to move around. It's very close to being fully enclosed, which means that when it is fully enclosed, it's definitely going to be a beast for ABS. It can reach tempers very, very quickly, and it does hit fairly decent speeds, but unfortunately my test unit has been anything but reliable. So in the end, the power supply was the true Ghostbuster here. Now I'm not ready to give this printer up, but unfortunately anything I do beyond this at this point is going to be outside of the original design. I'm planning to replace the stepper motor drivers with something a little more modern. I am going to finish and closing it. I'm going to see what else we can do to it to get it working really, really well. So I'm excited to show that off on the channel. So please feel free to stay tuned and I'll show you what I come up with. And of course, any models I designed to aid with that uh, improvement are going to be released free on Thingiverse. Because when it comes down to it, I ain't afraid no ghost. If you find yourself wanting one of the Flying Bear Ghosts, I've included a link in the description below and I believe it is currently listed at $389.99 on Gearbest.